Hey everyone, welcome back to the uh, Wealth Preservation Podcast. We are back on with Brett Owens. Uh, and, and of course, I've got my uh, co-host, Josh Saunders. Josh, how's it going? Doing great, man. I'm excited to have Brett on. And, uh, we're going to, if you didn't uh, catch his first episode, make sure you go back and listen to that. He's talking kind of about his entrepreneurial journey and how he kind of ended up where he's at today. And I think the topic we have today about talking about self-funding versus going and getting VC money and some other stuff like that is going to be pretty interesting. Um, but Brett, welcome. We're glad to have you back. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Mark. Good to yes. be back. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and I, you know, I, I will say if if you're listening right now and you're someone who is like, hey, I have this idea to uh, to go just get a concept, go out and get investors, and then bounce. This might not be the episode for you because Brett's okay. going to really be digging into uh, self funding and bootstrapping. So uh, this, this should be this should be an interesting topic, a topic for the for the Silicon Valley. <laughs> Yeah, it's basically one for the little guys, I would call it, right? Yes, like, you know, yes. No VC money, yeah, just go for it, right? So, it's real talk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perfect. So real quick, um, in, in case anyone hasn't listened to the first episode, Brett, can you give us a quick two-minute snapshot of you know your, your two startup companies that you've exited from and then the two that you're with now and, and kind of what you're focused on? Yeah, sure. You bet, Mark. So this all uh, started, I left my day job the first time, 2008 in a software company called Prometo, where we focused on time tracking software for kind of really old school industries, law, accounting, that type of thing. We realized that we needed a way that resellers who had been selling into those industries for the last 10,000 years could uh, refer our new product to their clients. So we created, uh, instead of purchasing something off the shelf, we stubbornly created our own software called it Lead Dino and spun it off as its own company. So that became a referral affiliate tracking system mm-hmm. that we launched in 20, late 2012, 2013, really. We got it to market and then began working with e-commerce uh, provider, uh, e- really e-commerce stores, Shopify stores, big commerce, those types of uh, merchants where they would use Lead Dino to track referrals and affiliate sales uh, for people who were um, you know, hopefully promoting their stores. At which point we realized, hey, uh, everyone's coming to us and they're taking our affiliate tracking software and asking where they can find affiliates. Uh, So we created a network of affiliates and then ended up spinning that out on its own. And and I ended up taking that over after I drove um, my two co-founders insane on the lead dyno side. (laughs) And this is called Affluencer. And we focus on matching up not only affiliates, but it's really turned into influencers, creators, ambassadors, these types of folks who have followings, they're creating content on platforms like Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. So we're matching creators up on those platforms with brands, with merchants um, who are looking for uh, marketing partners there. And then to your point, in parallel, I've also kind of been working in the um, financial writing, financial newsletter world. And my current uh, company there is a a website I've been with since we started in 2015 called Contrarian Outlook. And we're publishing... Uh, daily insights there on dividend investing, retirement portfolios, and, and those types of things. So the main thing I got from that is, Brett, you're kind of a psychopath, serial entrepreneur, and uh, you just want to do everything, So, which is good. I try to do anything that keeps me from having to go get a real job, Josh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> love it. So yeah, I, try love to have layer, I try to have layers between me and the corporate world. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. perfect. Well, well, you know, this episode is really going to be about, you know, growing, you know, taking that concept and growing it and, and, uh, you know, again, getting investors versus uh, bootstrapping. So, you know, to kick things off, I, how would you define bootstrapping or, or, you know, just a general, you know, general self-funding uh, versus, a, you know, going out and getting investors? Sure. So to me, I've always, uh, Bootstrap my own companies or self fund or whatever you want to call it, uh-huh. and I guess to me that's just you're you're writing uh, you're probably losing money on your company for the first days, <laughs> weeks, months, right. and years, so that the bills go to you at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Where if you're raising money, and I'm saying from someone who sees people raise money but has never uh, done it himself, first out of choice and probably out of stubbornness now, um, is uh, someone else would write you a check and then you're going to use their money to start up your business in exchange for that you're going to give them a percentage of your business and you're going to um, kind of have a boss so to speak again where you're going to work with that person or those investors or the firm who wrote you a check and you're going to keep them up to date every uh, week every month every quarter on on how you're doing yeah i kind of 
why did you go the self-funding route? Really, you know, obviously, maybe not having a boss, but why, why was that more appealing to you than going out and raising, raising funds, right? So the first time around, Josh, you don't have much of a choice. Uh, I did the <laughs> a little bit of a uh, lo- lo- local circuit where I talked to the angel investors, talked to the venture capital firms. Nobody really wants to fund a first-time entrepreneur, a first-time person. And luckily, I kind of picked up on that early on where um, they're willing to have a lot of nice conversations with you and keep in touch and say, well, once you get to this certain milestone in terms of sales, then we can talk about funding, to which I thought, well, once we get to that level of sales, why do I need you or why do I need your money? I'll just Mm -hmm. keep doing my own thing then. So I just kind of shut it off and said, okay, well, um, it's us against the world. We're not getting outside help. So we're just going to do it ourselves and self-fund. And that's just what we're going to do because we don't have a choice. So I did it that way the first time and then kind of preferred that approach the second time and, uh, and, and subsequent. So, so Brett, that's, that's the brutal honesty side of you where, uh, you know, you say where most people would probably spin that and say like, well, I was just so fiercely independent. I wasn't going to take anyone else's money. You were more like, and eh, no one wanted to fund my projects. Nobody <laughs> wanted to fund. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> wanted to fund us. Um, where it gets tricky though, Mark, a lot of people have nice conversations with us. Yeah. And you can spend a lot of time just kind of doing the road show, feel like uh, you're accomplishing something. Here we're about 90 minutes from Silicon Valley. So I, I you know, I'm able to drive down. I can mm-hmm. uh, have nice conversations with people who will, who will take a meeting um, and then drive back and act like I accomplished something, but I didn't. And uh, yeah, it's kind of up to you to read between the lines and I can say, okay, well, we're having nice conversations, but yeah, uh, they don't want to fund me. And, so, and yeah. what what are some of the, you know, because I, I think that's like the attractive, you know, there's an attractive pull to like, man, I'm just going to, someone's going to believe in me so much. They're going to write me a check and that's just going to be awesome. To you, what are some of those strings attached that people might not be noticing when someone cuts you that check? One string is that they want their money back at some point. And a lot of us, we go and we start our own companies because we don't want real jobs. And uh, once we get a point to a point where there's money coming in, we say, well, this is great. I mean, what else do I have to do? I'm, I'm doing my own thing. I'm making some money. And what else do I have to do? Well, the string then is pulling on you saying, oh, hey, remember that check I cut you? Uh, I want out. I want liquidity on that. And by the way, I'm not just looking to get paid back. I'm looking for a 10x to a 40x return. 10x to a 40x return is a pretty healthy size return. So that string kind of came to you at a for a round number i don't think anyone gets funded at this valuation this will show my age at a million dollar valuation well if it's a million dollar valuation and they cut you a check for it that means they're looking for you to sell between 10 and 40 million dollars that's a pretty big exit so that means there are some, also some things you need to do once you take that money to sort of fulfill those obligations that you kind of either implicitly or explicitly made to your investors yeah so I, I kind of step back about raising money. How does it kind of, I've heard a lot of people say that raising money sometimes even almost distracts from building the product, right? You're so focused on trying to raise that next round that you're not really focused on actually building the product that could actually sell it, and give them a good exit. But kind of, how, how do you kind of, you know, balance those two? Or have you heard of people balancing those two? It's very tough because I think to your point, Josh, the fundraising is a full-time job. And if I go back to my experience, my first company, there were two of us. So we had my co-founder who actually, you know, did the actual work in terms of the development and engineering of the product. And then there was me who couldn't do any development. So I was the face guy and I was in charge of marketing and doing all the quote unquote business stuff. Well, yeah, I could either have nice conversations with investors all day or I could try to actually sell the thing. It's kind of tough to do both. So that's where I kind yeah. of made the decision. And by the way, all the conversations with the investors was that, we want to see some sales coming in before you're going to give you money anyway. So all past kind of led to, hey, we better get some customers and, and sell this thing. And then that just took us down a path of, well, if we're going to sell this thing, then why, why do we need those investors? We kind of wanted them early on to make it more comfortable. But then investors don't want to give you money to make it more comfortable. So there is that kind of um, in between where it was just ended up not making sense for yeah. why to take the money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I really think that I think Silicon Valley gets a lot of the uh, the sexy headlines, right? But most businesses are self funded. There's a you know that's how really the world works, right? The VC thing was kind of a a knockoff of the late you know late '90s, early 2000s, where you know these all these ideas were going to change the world, and 
you can argue whether they have or you know, make the world better or whatever. You can argue that they have or haven't, right? But for the most part, most businesses, you know, you're gonna you're not gonna need you're not gonna have that big that big exit. You're gonna just go do well, right? And right, 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 exactly. Yeah, you you want to start a business, so that's your that, that that's your goal. I remember going right. to a startup networking event. It was down in the valley, and this was probably 10 plus years ago where everyone kind of stood up and said what they did in their milestones. You said your major milestones and everyone talked about the amount of money that they had raised. And I just thought it was crazy because they're talking about money. They're talking about checks they had received and put in their bank accounts, but they're not talking about customers or products or anything that I thought actually mattered in the world. Uh, We had no money because we were unfundable and I had, Bank of uh, Chase and Bank of America and uh, Capital One as our backers, but we had real customers and real stuff going on. And that's uh, right. We, it kept us grounded kind of in that tangible world where um, I think the temptation is you're in that fantasy land of uh, it used to be TechCrunch back in the day where yep. that was always the, the headlines that would pollute everyone's mind and all the, all the tech blogs about the funding and, and who raised what money. So you you raise the money and then you would you would grow your company. I mean, shoot, I had a buddy. He was working for this uh, tech company. It was a physical product, and they had raised all sorts of money. I think they had raised like thirty million dollars, and they had less in daily sales than I had with my little garage shop bootstrap company <laughs> and a couple of guys. They had nothing. I mean, they had nothing yeah. going on for a company that was filled with a expensive San Francisco real estate 50 people and all these yeah. venture and i couldn't believe that they couldn't even get a product to market with all that infrastructure but that goes on down there um all the time it still does and it's just a lot of money floating around we can thank the federal reserve thank anyone we want to for all this funny money floating around probably yeah. separate conversation but a lot of money looking for a home and then that's just kind of that's reality no. um, highway 101 there yeah oh i mean kind of why do you think why do you think that you know i, mean, I won't say the silicon valley itself but why do you think that Natalia is out there and is it, is it because people are gamblers really at heart and really just want to go hit home runs? So they're willing to, to throw almost good money after bad to go fund things that really are just average at best. Right. And uh, what is this? Why, why, what's the psychology behind that? Do you think? Yeah, I think that's part. I think there's a lot of, from the investor standpoint, a lot of money looking for a home and the early VC firms, they did quite well, right? The, mm-hmm. They got the, all the inside deals and there have been the all the unicorn events. They all, they're all funded sure. by the same VC firms with those, sort of those insider connections. They do quite well. So from a money standpoint, um, it's it's worked before. So there's money going after it. From an entrepreneur standpoint, I mean, I, I know people who they, they want nothing more than for someone else to start their company for them. And that's to me, that's almost the, the shark tank mindset mm-hmm. where I, I, I mean, I've got a friend who's tried um, he's tried everything except really rolling up his hands and, and in my mind, uh, figuring out how to scale his own company. He's tried to get on a shark tank. He's tried to do a bunch of things um, to land sort of that uh, main person, whether it's a venture capitalist or shark from the show or someone who's got these connections to take you to the next level. And I think a lot of people look at these things as, as shortcuts that are there and I'm not sure that they that they are. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the show, it's, it's a TV show. I mean, stuff's come out. A lot of these deals never happen. And, and and how could these? Not that these sharks are not very successful people, but they've got a million things going on. How can they care about your little thing that they just kicked a couple of uh, fifty thousand dollars into, which for them is like kind of like throwing fifty cents in the Salvation Army jar? Like they there's they, they get their attention divided a million different ways. Yeah. So maybe you'll get them on the phone once a quarter, but it's not the type of thing that's going to take your business. To the next well, and, and, and it kind of touches on like, you can't just throw money at stuff and that's what, you know, and, and then it works, right? There are fundamentals and there are, you know, like you said, you got to get a product out there. You got to start selling, you got to raise that stuff. So, you know, just saying like, well, if we get a bunch of money, it's like, get a bunch of money. Now you just have a bunch of money and some people who want it back. You know? that, that's right. That's right, Mark. Yeah, they're, they're kind of the fundamentals. And if we look at the SaaS world or the software world, they're kind of like these it's kind of like sports where there's just fundamental things that you need to do. Otherwise you're not going to be able to get to the next level. So with the software company, you need a, you need a product, you need a product that people use, you need a product that people preferably pay for. So that's on the product side. And then on the marketing and sales side, you need to figure out how to market the product and then preferably how yeah. to do it effectively. 
And while money helps with the experimenting, it's not necessarily the be all end all. And it can actually be a bad thing in terms of having too much of it because you'll do stuff that maybe doesn't work, especially from a marketing standpoint. And the show Silicon Valley does an awesome job at showing, you know, just kind of blowing a couple million dollars on a party here or there. So the, yeah. the type of stuff that does go on in the Valley and in the city now that just really doesn't kind of work in real life. But if you've got a few million extra bucks, you'll just throw it around because why not? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, kind of talk about, I mean, I, again, we're talking about the funding part of it, but, you know, it, it seems like there's lots of times you have somebody who kind of hit a home run on a company just, and maybe, you know, they're just right place, right time, right? Like, you kind of go back to the argument of Bill Gates, you know, he kind of hit a home run only because he was the right market and the right software when computers were taking off, right? Like, that's a, a huge argument, right? Right. And you have some of these other founders who, you know, they might have, hit a home run with a, with a VC, you know, with a venture capital investment, but that doesn't mean that they're great business minds, right? Sometimes there's a lot of luck to them, but they have so much money now that everybody thinks they're some sort of genius and they have just a bevy of bad ideas. That's right. Yeah. It, it's, it's tough to tell behind the cloak what was actually going on or who was doing the work and what was luck and what was skill. Small sample sizes we're talking about in every sure. aspect. You could be talking about a sample size of one, to your point, with, with Gates. I mean, it, it, it worked, and he became the richest dude in the world for a while. Um, does he know everything about solving everything? Um, right. He thinks he does. I was going to say, well, it depends on if you ask him or not. Yeah, oh, yeah. exactly. <laughs> right, right. So you're going off of these small sample sizes. I mean, I took some statistics courses in college. We had that notion of you need a, a, a large enough sample for it to right. matter, for it to know if there was yeah. skill involved or not. And loosely speaking, usually you need about 30 samples just to go with something to go. Well, nobody has 30 samples in their in their startup history. Yeah. Everyone's got one or two or three. And if something worked once, everyone's going to take credit for it. And oh, by the way, the one that worked, not only was there skill or luck, but then there were multiple people involved. And it could have been one guy doing all the work and then the other people take credit for it. So right. it's, it's so hard to know what actually uh, separating uh, that, the right place, right time from um, what actually happened. And then... Also, the just the, the success rates are, especially on the on the flashier stuff, the tech right. stuff, the Silicon Valley stuff. The success rates are so small that it, it's also hard to tell because yeah. there is that yeah. component there sure. as well. So it, it, yeah, it's really hard to tell. I mean, each each situation I think is different, and it's tough to kind of take advice from someone. I think just kind of spouting down off the yeah. off the mountain on all the stuff that that you can do. I haven't really found any advice to be something that you can just take from some gurus uh, other than this podcast, of course, <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. A, normal, a normal run of the mill podcast. Now you can't just use that playbook and apply it to your life or your, or your startup as you're going. So uh-huh. each situation is different and you're kind of getting down in the weeds of your specific situation. And let's be honest, like who knows that's going to, how that's going to work. It's kind of your job to, to figure that out. Yeah. 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 So I mean, it really, it really is. I mean, especially on the VC side, finding the right partner, right? I mean, it really has to work, right? Yeah. I mean, it has to be not just it has to not know something about your business, but just match philosophically and business style and all of that, right? So almost like it, it's multiple things that have to come into work. For and then your time, right, right, and your time frame also has to work because they're going to want their exit in the five to ten year period, and they want it at a certain scale. Right. So even if you're maybe rowing in the same direction, they may want you to go faster. Yeah. Yeah, to, to get there sooner. So that's another another concern. And um, you know, at the end of the day, I at least from my standpoint, I was always kind of unemployable, where um, I just don't really don't want to work for someone, and I'm told what to do. I just have the worst attitude in the world. So right. that's something that would come out really fast for me with an investor, where that would just kind of yeah. blow up and, and not be a good situation. So it's better if it's just uh, my credit cards and, and my wife glaring at me. <laughs> And bring the pull back on the funding side, so to speak. So what we're saying is, your wife is probably one of the better VCs in in California. Is probably the she's one of the uh, yeah she's one of the foremost right. (laughs) Like my partnership, I married the guy. Gosh, yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We do have a photo from our wedding where it's me with her health insurance card. (laughs) <laughs> and she thought it was funny at the time, but six months later, I left my job and never had healthcare again, other than through her <laughs> corporate power um, healthcare. 
Uh, yeah. Well, and, and so let's let's uh, shift back to the self funding side now too. So, what are some like absolutely like do nots or or huge errors that people make when they do go down the self funding route? You know, I mean, you know, taking a second mortgage on the house. I mean, you can get as specific as you want as far as like things you've seen either go really wrong or maybe you know you've done incorrectly yourself. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I I've been in I, you know my darkest place was I had about. I, in my first company, I kept taking out these one year things on, on your credit card, no interest for one year. Mm -hmm. You had to pay the two or 3%, right? But when I needed some money, I could get 8,000 or 10,000 or $13,000 uh, just by opening up a new credit card and doing the, so I was good for a year. Um, I found that to be easier than going to a bank. Bank wouldn't, I mean, I talk about a, a venture capital firm wouldn't touch me, an angel uh, investor, like a respectable one who actually had money, didn't want to fund me. Um, a bank, I mean, why would a, a bank's not going to give a business loan to a, a company yeah. without a business? <laughs> so that's out. So now you're looking at things and we had no mortgage at the time. So there was no second mortgage. We had no first mortgage. Um, so, you know, just pile up some credit cards before the credit card companies cut you off. So I did at one point have $55,000 credit card debt and it was okay for a while. It was zero interest, but then the juice starts ticking and going the other way on you. Um <laughs> But, but but that said, I mean, you don't actually have a lot of good choices. I thought that was a better option than the alternative. The biggest mistake that I see and that, you know, we've had to battle with internally with my teams, with the self-funding, I say with, with the founders, is that nobody else cares that you're self-funded. So you might be competing with, a, uh, and we have, I mean, we've competed with other software companies who have raised money and they have a $10 million round and we have my $10,000 credit card. Uh, a, a customer or user, they don't care. Like they don't feel bad for me because we've self-funded. So we can't just say, well, we're, we're bootstrapped on our podcast here in the trust tree. It's a badge of honor out on the street. Nobody cares. So the biggest right. mistake I think is acting like you're self-funded. Like you can't be that poor, you can't act poor. You can't act like you're cutting corners. You can't act like you're not moving fast enough because you don't have the resources. So you still got to project like you're moving, like you're funded. Um, nobody actually cares where the money's coming from, but you got to kind of project that like, hey, we're real and we're going. So I think having that level of urgency and not being sort of that half started startup is the big thing with the bootstrap where people will kind of they bootstrap something forever and it's never that profitable and it never loses that much money and just kind of like picks along. And a lot of times that's not the point. Like you're trying to get to cruising altitude on this stuff and it does require some firepower up front. However you fund it, whatever you got to do to get the money, um, you know, we're not going to ask questions on that. So I think, you know, get the money, do what you have to do, be smart about it, but you also don't want to act, don't act like a loser. I mean, yeah. don't act like you've got that. <laughs> Otherwise, people sense that and then they don't want to, they want to do business with you. You're not going to be around in six months. You can't pay your credit card. Yeah. Right. You know, like, hey, we, we, we're, you know, we're funded off of uh, $55,000 of credit card debt. But yeah. I swear a balance transfer thing is going to come in the mail any day now. We're just going to, yeah, right. you know, call it up credit card companies. Like, hey, do you have any, uh, do you have any uh, deals going on right now? Can I just transfer this all over to you guys now? <laughs> that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, I took it from, uh, I don't think I have the book here, but it was Robert Heinlein. I think it was Moon is a Harsh Mistress, where the moon is in the battle with the earth and the moon has less resources. And they say, uh, and, and they have limited firepower. They say, or Heinlein writes, like, it's better, better to run out of ammunition then act like you're running out of ammunition. So they just fired everything and you just see what happens. Oh, go for it. And I, yeah, and I kind of took that approach with Chromato where I said, okay, we're going to advertise every month in this popular publication called Techno Lawyer, which is geared for our audience. And we're going to act like we're the biggest, hottest thing here. Like beyond January, I have no money. In September, <laughs> October, November, December, we're going. And then uh, we're not, we're not, so we're not going to act like we're, <laughs> we don't have the resources. We're going. And then we'll let, let everything, let the dust settle after that. So I think that's the big thing is just to act like you're, you're, you're coming out hot and you're in it to win it, uh, whether you have the resources to win or not, at least pretend and yeah. go hard. You're like, yeah. hey, no, no uh, company would advertise this much unless they had tons of cash. I mean, you'd be an idiot to advertise this much unless you had tons of cash. So exactly. we're going to be around forever, guys. And exactly. I, think, I, I like that analogy because I think it's much different than fake it or make it, right? Because faking it is just faking it, right? That's having nothing. This is just like basically pushing all your chips in the middle of the table and being like, here we go, bombs yeah. away, you know, right. flag patterns for everybody, you know, Hail Mary, right. every time, go for it, you know? That's right, yeah. 
Yeah, you're yeah. being aggressive early, and you're just not going down quietly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think the I I don't I, I I understand right like you said the fake it till you make it saying, but I, I don't really like it either. It just it doesn't capture I think the spirit of it because yeah you're not you're not necessarily faking it. What you're doing um, is I mean look fake it till you make it was like the Elizabeth Holmes stuff right where yeah. they, you know they have nothing and, and obviously yeah. they're, they're, and yeah. there's a, there's a balance in entrepreneurship because you're always kind of selling what you don't quite have but you're going to have it soon or you're, you're, you're going to get there soon so there is that balance but yeah this is kind of like being aggressive early and just going for it and in my mind just going and trying to win the market or win your your, your little corner of it and then see where you're at versus right. tiptoeing in you, you tiptoe in and nobody respects you and then you kind of you kind of get ignored and that's yeah. the that's the, i want to go back to, to raising funds because i've heard this before um you know when you're trying to raise money, there's always these investors that will take meetings with you, and it, it just turns into just the biggest waste of time. You're basically, you know, those people either don't have funds or really aren't going to invest. And, you know, for people that are out there trying to raise money, how do you kind of avoid that, right? I mean, how do you be strategic and not get your time wasted a whole bunch? There are definitely a lot of investors with no money who are happy <laughs> to who are yeah. happy to talk to you. Um I wish I knew for sure how to tell who's who from not, because to me, there were ever, we dealt with a lot of time wasters. And, yeah. And, and that, we either dealt with time wasters or people who fair enough said it was our first time and then they weren't going to yeah. uh, fund us. And then second, third time, I just, we, I'd never even had the conversations with those people. So, <laughs> right. um, you know, I would have thought that they'd be willing to, to write checks second or third time. I mean, second time we just went out and then we just sold the company. So we didn't have, there was no intermediary. I mean, it was nine years apart, but there was no, hey, we're looking for money. Um, but I think you can tell. I mean, I guess if I'm going to use the analogy of our acquirer who, you know, had the money and wrote a check up front, I think you can tell up front how people are, how, how interested they are about the deal versus the cocktail party. And if you're, you're just, you want to, I think, kind of be critical of it and just kind of keep pushing the issue. Like, hey, we're trying to, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get a deal to close, whether you're trying to get funded or you're ultimately trying to sell your company. So you're getting hundred percent funded. But if you're trying to get funded, you're trying to push to a deal. And what do we need to do to get a deal closed versus just kind of having these conversations that right. go on and on and on without uh, much. I mean, who, who doesn't want to say they're an angel investor? I mean, it sounds really cool. I mean, I know people, you know, they're, I know angel investors, angel investors who have written not many checks. I mean, less than $10,000 which is crazy. Why not to me? Why not just take it out of your credit card? I, I, I don't understand the yeah. point of getting a check like that or having that type of conversation. But I think just kind of keep drive that conversation to something, some sort of fruition versus a nice coffee. Meeting. Yeah. L lots of wasted cups of coffee. <laughs> right. Right. Everyone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I just think it's a better, you know, there, you either need to be funded or you don't, but there comes a time when it's either like put up or shut up and we're, we're trying to build a company here. So either hop on board or we're just going to keep the train driving. That's right. I think having a timeline on the stuff is good. Um, always like in any negotiation, having multiple potential investors is good. So mm -hmm. then you can put a deadline on it. There's that notion of competition from the yeah. investor standpoint. Right. They don't have to know. They And again, this is kind of like, as long as they think there's other investors, that's good. And as long as you put a deadline on it, then there's that sense of urgency, sense of competition from their standpoint also. So that can be helpful. Now that said, if you put a deadline on some, you need to hold the deadline. So it's like the negotiating trick where you're going to walk out if something doesn't happen. I mean, you need to kind of hold to that and and, right. and and that's it. But I think just just sort of setting those groundworks are good and kind of playing, playing hardball with it too. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 you know, because you had touched on the, uh, you know, not not faking it, but but being very uh, you know confident and bold, and I'm I'm sure that if you put a deadline like hey January first, then January second, you're like you know we had a last minute spot open up, you can still write us a check. It, it definitely does come off. It's like eh, okay, maybe you really really need my money. Hmm. Uh, right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, and then that is where it helps. To Josh's point, like being a being a little bit of a lunatic helps. Yeah. I can uh, at least for a moment in time, January second, I'll be pissed. Write somebody out of my life, and then they they think I went somewhere else even though I'm just being a baby, but I'm, I'm, I'm men mentally I'm gone. And then as far as they know, maybe I got money from somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so I, I guess like pre um, you know, pre going into, you know, kind of, kind of touching on the self-funding um, you know, maybe, maybe right before launching, 
Did you, um, maybe not with your first one, but your second company have a nest egg or, or do you have like kind of a good, like, Hey, if you have X amount, you're probably good to get through like one year. Right. I mean, do you have like a rule of thumb around uh, self-funding just from a nest, nest egg standpoint? I think we're, if we look at the two paths that we can go, uh, and if we're talking tech, then we need somebody to build the tech. So that means uh-huh. we have a, a developer, somebody with development expertise, which my standpoint was not me. So there either has to be someone who's willing to be a co-founder and work for free, or you're going to have to pay out of pocket and pay someone to do your development. So that that's going to depend on the nest egg there. Uh-huh. Market term requirements so if we're talking um if we're talking a developer as a co-founder then what do we need money for we need money for marketing we need money to kind of get this thing out there i would probably feel comfortable maybe if we're looking at like a ten thousand dollar a month type thing just for expenses Mm -hmm. and this and that then we're looking at about a hundred thousand one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year to get it out there and then if we say well we really want like a two-year runway so $240,000, I think it sounds less intimidating if we break it down monthly. And can you do it for less than 10K a month? Sure. But then, again, we're looking at it from the marketing standpoint. Like, what do we need to do to get this thing out to market? Um, assuming that we've got the development talent we need in-house from our partner who's working for free. If we're outsourcing that, then you need to pay someone. And it's probably it's going to be at least another $10,000 um, if we can do it smartly um, out of pocket, you know, I, from that standpoint. So from my experiences, so Chromata, we ended up, uh, we put a lot of money into. Um, I never looked at it as it was going because it was kind of depressing, but I would just kind of keep writing checks in. I would throw 5000 in a month, 5000 in a month, 5000 in. By the end, and this is from 2008 out to like 2014, as we were growing the company, ended up putting about over $300,000 in to the company. And this was having a developer work uh, right. as a co-founder. For, for free, but that was just kind of over time what it took to get the product to market, um, get it out there. With Lee Dino, my second company had two co-founders and we just kind of had a little more fortune, I think, on the marketing channels where we were able to get into some uh, Shopify app store. We were able to do some stuff for free. We got some revenue coming in earlier on. For that company, we put $18,000 in total amongst three people and that was that. And then, sure, we worked for free for a couple of years, but then we were taking money and paying ourselves back and then paying yeah. salaries as it went. So, um, it is different. It does kind of depend, um, uh, you know, but uh, I think figuring out that you figure out what you think your monthly burn rate is going to be, you probably need to multiply two or three, or if you're me, maybe even a little more, just because like I said, I, I just really get focused on um, being aggressive early and not looking like you're, you're broke. So that's kind of where you want to look yeah. at it, I think, from that standpoint. But you probably need to give it at least two years or three years. Um, but at least two to kind of put your head down and see, okay, do we have anything or not? Because uh, the first year goes by pretty fast. You may not have too much at that point. Which is funny, you know, walking through those numbers, you know, uh, uh, you know, like you said, hey, break down monthly. It sounds a lot less intimidating. Uh, it's funny. There's so many, you know, Amazon and, and Disney and all these, you know, big companies. It's always this like, hey, and they started out of a garage, right? This is like romanticized. It's like, Yes, because they had nothing else, right? Like there's no other option, right? When you're looking at those numbers, you're like, how do I make this cheaper? Well, I'm working out of my garage, I guess. Right? You got to make right. it work somehow. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, you make it work somehow. So these days, a lot of people working remote. Um, although I, you know, I did find it helpful, um, especially with lead data. I mean, we had an office where we were all working together for six years. So those six initial years and coming in every day. And of course, these, these were pre-COVID times, but I think it, it was helpful to yeah be in person doing that so we were yeah. paying i mean that was a twenty four hundred dollar a month rent expense which is not nothing but from a synergy standpoint it, it mm-hmm. was helpful uh, so having that proverbial garage to go to which is nice versus it's tough especially getting to know someone for the first time um getting to know them on zoom is tougher than obviously working working side by side with yeah them. yeah yeah so uh we, we get this question often on from, from an entrepreneurial standpoint of you know, when should I quit my day job to pursue the, you know, the, the, the entrepreneurial dream or whatever. And, you know, there's lots of, you know, there's the, Hey, just go for it. You know, throw it, throw the deep ball and just go for you it. You can dream the, it. You can do it. If you dream it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That whole crowd. Or there's the, Hey, you know, why don't you build it up on the side and keep it a side hustle until it's, you know, making enough money that you think you can support it. I mean, kind of where do you fall on that? Or is it really situational dependent? 
I think I'm more on the deep ball side from a practicality standpoint. I've, I've read the arguments and, and I know like the 37 signal story where they will ever start base camp on the side and keep their day job. And there were, you know, for a while they were like the foremost proponents, I mm-hmm. think, of keeping the yeah. day job, the chicken entrepreneur approach where you have the day job and you do these side hustle. And when your side hustle income meets your day job income, then you leave your day job. I think that sounds great. I've never actually seen it work in person. That's the, the problem yeah. that I have with it. I have a I have a buddy now. He's got no he's, no joke. Five companies on the side in addition to the day job, and they're all successful in that. They have a product to market, and they have real sales. And in aggregate, he's making no money from any of these companies. However, and he still has his day job that he's reluctant to quit. And he knows, and I know, he has to quit his day job. But every month, he calls me and he says, "What do I need to do?" And then I say, "Do you need me to tell you again?" Huh. Yeah. And it's not a guarantee if he quits his day job that he's going to get one of these things up to cruising altitude. But unfortunately, having split attention, it kind of mm-hmm. it's so difficult to get something to scale and get something to market and then sell it that if it's not your sole focus, that's going to be really, really tough to do, especially you're, you're talking minimum, usually 40 hours a week people are working uh, later in life. And then you got the family going and sure. you got nights and weekends are kind of toast from that standpoint so it's going to be really hard harder and harder if you don't have that eight those eight to five hours as your sole focus yeah. so i think you go for it and then you always and then then i do think you have to spend more than a year on it also so i think you got to give it at least two or three years and then you fall back as we've talked previously i don't think you'll be a setback financially as you might you may fear because our tax code is set up yeah. that you're yeah. getting taxed uh, pretty healthy on your current salary so you'll you're not going to miss out on as much money and savings as you as you right. thought you would. My first five years of Kermet, I mean, I was I was making um, pretty good salary. I mean, I was 26 years old, making 100. I just topped 100k a year mark, which was always kind of a goal. And then I quit my day job, and then I'm making. I went from nothing, and then the next year I made negative eighty thousand. And my accountant told me I made negative eighty thousand. I said, "Hey, Bert, that's awesome." You know, from a tax write off yeah. he goes, yeah, Oh, right, sure, that's right. awesome. Yeah. Try not yeah. to lose eighty thousand dollars next year, okay? Can we, can we <laughs> fill up that hole a little bit? Yeah. But long story short, five fast forward five years, I'm thirty one and I hadn't made a dime in five years. I wasn't actually that far behind financially as I would have thought, just being uh-huh. a broke guy, not making any money. Right. Um, so it is interesting how it, it, you don't fall as far behind as you think. So in my opinion, I think you gotta go for it because you need your full mind um going. And that doesn't mean that's going to work. But if you're keeping that day job, it's it's really stacking the odds. Yeah, it's dividing time. Almost yeah. guaranteeing that you're not it's not going to happen. Well, well, and we've had we've had entrepreneurs bring up in the past too. You know, when, when they had talked about like, hey, what happens if it if it fails? And they're like, with everything that you do in that year, two years that you're on your own, you become so much more employable that to think that you can't then turn around and get a job if you really needed one, you know, is just kind of you know insane, right? Unless you're really that, you know, unless you're really that unemployable, but for the most part, I mean, the, what you learn in that first year or two, I mean, you're going to turn around and be able to do something with that. That's so. right. That's right, Mark. Yeah, you're building up the skill. You're building up a uh, skill set where you can go get a. I mean, you can go be a product manager. Yeah. A mar- go get a marketing job. Yeah. Uh, developer, you can get a development job, um, or you might end up like me, where anytime I thought something wasn't going to work, you get that pit in your stomach, and it's the worst feeling <laughs> in the world. It's like, oh, oh God, I might have to go get a real job for once, <laughs> and then you just kind of. Yeah, and you just kind of figure out a way to yeah. kind of keep the nonsense, keep keep it going, and uh, stay away from that. So you you had mentioned you know going to those meetings where everyone's bragging about how much money they'd you know been able to raise from outside investors, and you're sitting there thinking like, well, that you know I think that is a bad thing. So in, in your mind, if you're self funded, um, or if you're going the self funded route, what what's a good um, I guess like benchmark, like one year anniversary benchmark, sales benchmark, uh, to just know like, hey, I feel like I'm failing, but I'm headed in the right direction. I think at that one year mark, if you can get something out there and get someone paying for it, that's that's kind of a good one to one to punch. Because then at least you've got the model where not only do you have somebody using whatever it is that you built, but you've got someone else paying for it. And it doesn't have to be um, a, a, the scale isn't as important at that standpoint. So I mm-hmm. guess if I'm going to give you a, a, my most recent example, so I started Affluencer. It was March of 2019, and we had really nothing for a year and a half. I mean, we were had an idea of what we wanted to build in terms of an app and a platform, 
We started working towards that, but we kind of had nothing tangible. However, we, we put a uh, Stripe payment collection up on our signup flow really within six months, and we started letting people sign up for premium plans. We had nothing premium. There was nothing premium about us other than if you signed up for a premium plan, we were going to hustle and do what we needed to do to if you're a brand match up with influencers or be an influencer to kind of promote you and that type of thing. Um, and from our standpoint, what it did is it proved that people were willing to pay for this and, and it helped us kind of gear the business model towards, okay, this looks like it works. So from my standpoint, okay, I should keep the business going because it looks like there's a business mm-hmm. there. So there's something there and it helps you kind of prove things out and, and it guides you. So I think if you're collecting money within a year and you've got some sort of product, then that is the, that that's where you want to be. No, perfect. Yeah. Cause I, I think that, it, you know, and just any money, it, you know, collecting any money in that first year, you're, you're going to be, you know, in the top tier of startups. I mean, a lot of startups yeah. don't collect money in that first year. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. And, then, and then the big mis- the, and then the, the counter, the big mistake is we have these startups that never, they never get to market where they never yeah. have a product out there or worse, they never have pricing or they never have customers. Right. So it's, they're always in that pre-launch beta stage. And it goes year after year where they're they're fine tuning, they're fine tuning, and then it just never it never quite happens. You, you, the, you get the best insights in terms of fine tuning once you actually have something to market and you're out there. Um, so you need to kind of get there as fast as you can, and then start yeah. moving moving to yeah, shake. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So I was talking about a couple of mistakes. You know, you're you're kind of a salty veteran nowadays of the entrepreneur world. You know <clears throat> when you. When you hear somebody either you know, really pitch you with an idea or they're talking about an idea or they're talking about their business, kind of like your buddy that has five businesses going and none of them are profitable. Um, you know, what are those mistakes that you hear that you're like, oh, my gosh, man, you're just, that's a yeah. recipe for disaster. Hold the ripcord now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Funny. The big mistake, the one is that people just keep talking like they yeah. they they, t- t- they tell me. Uh, and and before kind of the world went into lockdown, I mean, I would used to get referred to local startup people who were early on, mm-hmm. and I'd say, "Hey, go meet with go meet with Brad, and he'll take a look at what you're doing." And maybe they're in a similar industry. Like I had a guy who had a billing product, and um, you know, he wanted to kind of kick it off me. Uh, so I invite him into the office. We grab coffee, and then he comes up to the office and kind of demos what he had going, and I kind of kicked some ideas ideas for him. I'm like, all right, well, here's how I would take this to market. I'm not really in that industry anymore, but these are the people I would approach. And um, I, I, I think he kind of had the day job. He just kind of kept talking, but he never kind of followed up with it. So I think that's the big thing is that anything, anything can kind of work. Um, you never know what's going to work to get tried, but that's what I see is it's the lack of trying or getting down into actually getting something to market. You see these people, and he was in that pre-launch stage forever where he yeah. had an app and it was kind of working and he just didn't know where to go next in terms of getting it to market and this or that. And that's kind of the, that I mean, that is from a from a fear standpoint, that's where people get I think, bashful or shame because now you're putting yourself out there because I built this and, and right. whatever you have it, you know, you, you launch it and let's be honest, like it probably sucks. Like early on, it probably sucks. So it's going to go out there. Then you have users tell you what a piece of crap it is, what a piece of crap you are. And um, that just kind of happens. So you got to embrace yeah. that. And it's it's tough early on, um, but you kind of kind of roll with it and give it your best effort to adjust. So that's the big thing is it's almost not about the idea or something being stupid as it's just that they just keep talking about something. And um you know, it's funny. I mean, my wife was at a coffee shop over the weekend and I guess these startup conversations were back because you heard somebody basically describing uh, like MailChimp or <laughs> Infusionsoft or yeah. an email marketing. And it was their idea where they were going to launch this company. And like, okay, well, first, you guys are 10 years late. Second, yeah. still, and, and not that you can't be late to a party. I mean, Kermetta, we were 30 years late to the party. And Lee Donna, we were 20 years late. So you, you can be late to a party, but you better get there. Uh, yeah. get there now. Yeah. Don't just keep talking about it. Get there, and then you can figure out your angle and whether you got. Something. And you better show up with a bunch of flash when you do show up too. Yeah, come, come big. Come yeah, come big. Exactly. Right, yeah. Come big. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, why, why do you think those conversations are coming back? Is it just the current market environment, or because people are getting these high valuations, or is it just you know is it the new is it the new cool thing to do? Kind of. Why do you think that is right now? Yeah, good question. Probably tracks the Nasdaq. I mean, we had the 
NASDAQ go crazy last year. So anytime you see the stock market go nuts, and there's money flying around. Mm -hmm. Obviously, our uh, Federal Reserve supporting a lot of this with all the money printing and stimulus checks going out. So anytime it's a speculative atmosphere, I think, yeah, tech tech is big and, and tech startups are cool again. And that's something that sure. everyone kind of wants to do. So, yeah, you hear those those types of conversations. I don't know from a, a being on the ground standpoint if it really matters uh, if, you're, if you're starting a company, to be honest. I mean, I've kind of started to start at that stuff through 2008. Um, actually, I kind of like the downtimes. We started, from it was 2008, and then Influencer, we, kept, we launched that app in 2020. So you're talking two kind of depressing times uh, to yeah. get something out there. Um, but I, I don't know if it matters if you're just, it's like anyone starting a business. Yeah. It's the best time to do it is now. You just kind of go for it. Yeah. And if there's other people floating around, talking in coffee shops or raising money. I'm not sure that affects what you're doing too much. No. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I just think good good business attracts good business, and if you have a good idea and you do it, you execute it well, it's gonna they'll probably do okay. They probably will. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That said, in my uh, rookie days, I, I I do recall. I mean, I, I would track our competitor from an obsessive standpoint. I mean, I knew I knew where he lived. I knew what his hobbies were. Um, <laughs> not yeah. creepy at all, Brett. That's right. not creepy right. at all. <laughs> right. Yeah. I can name. I can name more things about his life than, than you wanted to. I'm sure it was a one-way rivalry. He had no idea who I was, but he was raising all the money. Y Combinator raised the venture money, and then we were just the bootstrap guys coming out of nowhere. Um, but I kind of liked it that way, but I always kind of kept tabs on what our, our others were doing. Um, had a more jovial relationship with our second competitor where I'd see him at, at, at conferences, and he knew that my thing was I like to send our, our worst customers to him. So if I had to break <laughs> up with somebody... I would say, uh, you know, I don't know if we're the perfect fit for you, but go check out Alex at Reversion. He's awesome, and he'll do a great job. So I'd see him at the conferences and breakfast. But Alex, I just sent you a customer last night. He's like, what? I don't know if that's good news or bad news, Brad. Like, he, was, <laughs> he was just exhausted by me. Yeah. Awesome. Well, and, awesome. and, and you know, I mean, this might be a, a terrible idea, or, or um, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll let you dive into it, but. But uh, you know, as far as as far as like raising funding and and, and stuff like that, ha have you had any experience with like saying, hey, um, maybe instead of getting investors or raising funding, find a very compatible business and just try and tie yourself closely to them? Do, do you think that works, or does it maybe hurt you because now you're kind of attached to someone and your success is tied to theirs? From a partner standpoint, you're talking yeah, about Mark? yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, I can um, I can see that both ways. Uh, yeah, it's probably nuanced depends on the situation. So from my personal experience again so with Permata, you know we do the time tracking thing uh -huh. and there were the big vendors right uh, who we wanted to tie ourselves to lexus nexus westlaw these were like the big firms in that industry and they were natural partners for us and natural companies to buy us and it never ended up working out i had again nice conversations with them but it just never amounted to we always needed them more than they needed us and they were big corporate and they have bureaucracies so we were never able to get that to work. Um, if I fast forward to Lead Dino, Shopify was taken off on the e-commerce side in 2013, 2014, and we did an integration with them. We essentially almost not tied the whole business to Shopify's growth, but a lot of it. By the end, we were, you know, half of our customers were Shopify customers. And that was a great partnership. I mean, we were in there early and we just kind of floated on their rising tide. So mm -hmm. that that was great. Afluencer, we've done an integration there, but now it's a lot more competitive. So we're getting traction from Shopify, but not to the degree in which we saw Lead Dino seven years ago. So it kind of changes the situation. You know, it's always kind of evolving. Um, but there are definitely these, I, I, I think, you know, where you can find a bigger fish to tie yourself to. Um, it's tough to know in advance if it's going to mm -hmm, necessarily right. work or not, at least from my experience, where our big success was just kind of a <laughs> an accident <laughs> yeah. from, from our standpoint. Yeah. Well, I kind of want to jump into, you know, just influencer for, for a couple of minutes and just talk about that because obviously you're pretty passionate in, in that space at the moment. But, you know, kind of what does influencer do? How do you match those up? And kind of, you know, what's kind of that, what's the business model? there? Yeah, well, we started off um, just as a website and trying to build out a network. So we have, there's kind of the two sides to it. There's influencers and the brands. And we said, okay, well, I guess we need the influencers first. So we just started building up sort of this newsletter network where we would feature influencers on our site. Then we start working with brands and we don't have, we, you know, we don't have an app yet. We're kind of working towards that. 
So then we bring on some brands. Like I bring on a, this CBD brand and she's looking for fitness influencers from the Midwest with uh, followers or age 40 and up. So, um, I mean, I'm on my phone with kids sleeping in the back seat. Schools are closed. It's April 2020 or something like that. And I'm punching uh, text to my sister-in-law, who's a jazzercise instructor in Kansas City. And I'm trying to negotiate uh, $100, $100 a post for the CBD brand. And we're just kind of winging it and going, um, going that way with it. Now, that was a great experience. It's not at all scalable, of course, where <laughs> you can't have somebody uh, punching out a, a text to your sister-in-law, who's a jazzercise instructor. Like, hey, I need someone for this brand. And she's got $100 to pay. Will they, will they throw CBD up on their Instagram page for the 100 bucks? But that's how we did things in the early days. And at least it kind of gives you the model for sure. something that you want to mm-hmm. scale with an app. So then when we built out our app, we had a better idea of what we wanted to do. And then now that's what the app does where a brand could come in and say, okay, I've got the CBD product or I've got a fashion line. I have a clothing um, product, jewelry, whatever. And I'm looking for influencers. Now they can say, okay, I'm looking for influencers in these interests. I actually posted a collab for my financial book. And I said, okay, I'm looking for finance influencers with more than 20,000 followers. And I'm looking for them on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I don't have a demographic preference, but we do allow brands too. If they want to say male, female, other, in terms of what they're looking for, age or uh, specific interests. We look at some fashion and beauty influencers on TikTok with 25,000 or more followers, ages 30 to 35, they can do that. So kind of slicing and dicing. Mm -hmm. And then on the influencer side, we're matching them up. Um, based on the information that they give us. And then also they connect their social media accounts. They connect their Instagram, their TikTok, their YouTube, and then we're able to verify their statistics and then give kind of do that intelligent, smart matching between them gotcha. and the brand. Well, 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 Josh and I are, we're basically influencers. So, uh, you know, maybe you'll have some advice as to what products we can, you know, throw in here, right? I mean, Josh, what do you think you would probably uh, advertise? Mostly weight loss products if I were on. <laughs> I'm a big, pretty big deal there. I, I would yeah. be in the. I'd be I in the. Uh, them. I, I'd be in the uh, uh, denture adhesive for under thirty five. That's that's my sweet spot. Yeah, oh, Brett, I, I have uh, some teeth that glue in every day. That's uh, that's where that comes from. Uh, yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah. need, you guys on, need you guys on the platform. <laughs> no kidding, Jeez. affluencer, yeah. under thirty five denture cream. That's okay. right. That's right. That's huge. Uh, we yeah, could raise awesome, 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 dollars. So, you know, so kind of. You know, where do you see that? You know, how, how has it been, and what's that ride been like? And is, you said this is your, you know, your last entrepreneurial, your last entrepreneurial effort. You hope, which I would probably beg to differ, but you know, where do you kind of see this going? Well, we're just kind of uh, honestly, we're kind of feeling our way through. Where we knew there was something there. It's the first time I've ever done anything in a, in a new industry where it's kind of unfolding before yeah. your eyes. I mean, Provetta was was thirty years old; it was established. League Dino was like fifteen years old. And that's good and bad. I mean, it means there's an industry there. Um, it means you're, you're coming in late to the party as we speak. So you got to do something different. And yeah. for Meta, we had trouble differentiating ourselves just because everything was so old and, and stayed. Big Dino, we kind of came in the right place, right time. Stuff was moving more to social media. We could align our tracking with social media. So we were there and, and that worked out. Here, I mean, it's probably like a year and a half ago. I think it was before we launched our app. I mean, I'm still sitting around thinking, I hope there's something here. I wasn't sure, but there's enough to kind of keep putting one foot in front of the other. Like we, yeah. we know we've got influencers creating this content. It feels like that's where everything's going. You know, we have brands that are trying to get their products out there and then they're looking influencers. So there's kind of this natural matching. Um, but until you actually see it happening, you don't know. So now that we have the app out and we have the traction and people paying for it, we've actually both influencers and brands paying um to use it which is a good sign so you see it working and now you just try to now we're in what i think is fun where you can fine tune and make it better so we sure. recently launched the yeah, tiktok yeah. and youtube because we see that go out and then every time we come up with an idea we've got a feature list that we kind of work from and we're always prioritizing that and then on the marketing side i mean i'm, I'm still playing around with new ways and ideas ways that we can get in front of especially more brands and get their collabs posted in our app so we just kind of go one foot in front of the other from here yeah. kind of keep developing things but it's on a similar trajectory as we had especially with lead dino similar obviously business model and industry with the e-commerce yeah. side of things so you just kind of we keep doing that and then we also keep doing these integrations and you like to get as wide as you can so you're not just hey if someone does this feature here we're out of business so always like yeah. having stuff where you're cross-platform as they say so 
yeah. we integrate we integrate with Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. So there's three different companies there. Shopify app, so that's a different company there. And then we do a lot of stuff across all this. So as you're building up, and then there's value in the network also. So we're just always you know improving and recruiting more uh, for that. So it's just building and building really from there. Hey, I'm excited to read your self help book about you know how I launched the multi billion dollar business with a you know picked uh, an influencer from the mid a jazzer sized influencer from Kansas City. I mean, that's mm-hmm. a if I can do it, anybody can do it. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, watch yeah. out, Tony Robbins. Like, oh. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, we can do it. Yeah. yeah. And then we did we did start eating our own dog food recently. We, now we do collabs with our own influencers. So we've got micro influencer collabs and and macro influencers. So we'll work with our own users and um if they have five thousand or more followers where we'll pay them fifty, hundred, two hundred dollars to post something and then I give them creative rights. So I say, Hey, just talk about influencers. So if if it's whatever you want to do for the photo, you have the creative rights. I mean, keep it PG thirteen if you yeah. if you can. Yeah. And uh, just go and then uh, tell your influencer friends about us and send them your way and send them our way. And it's interesting. It's just kind of like wild, wild west where um, old school advertising where we don't track. We just kind of flip 50 bucks here, 50 bucks there. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, see what happens. That's all. And, and all without getting a giant check from someone in Silicon Valley. That's right. Completely self-funded. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, right. and a few credit cards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah. Awesome. Well, perfect. Mark, want to kick off the speed round? Yes, sir. So first, uh, one, one time, you know, we, we usually ask our, um, usually ask our entrepreneurs uh, about books that change their outlook. So if you were to tell an entrepreneur, you know, one or two books to go that just kind of radically changed your view, uh, what books are you recommending? I remember I read Art of the Start, the Guy Kawasaki one early on. Um, that's a good one. It gets the juices going. Yeah. Not sure there's anything tangible that you're going to take out of it. I mean, I love, love the book I'm from a motivational standpoint. So it gets you going. I think I read it when I still had my day job. So that really uh, gets you fired up. And that's what you need, I think, early on, at least get you that initial push. So I think it's good to have a book like that, get you energized. From a product market fit standpoint, there's a book by Steve Blank called Four Steps to the Epiphany. I think if you read step one, you're good. Um, but it's about what we talked about. We're getting a product out and then sort of aligning it. And then and again, this is probably more of a software or, or physical type product, mm-hmm. but I guess it could apply to any business where you're trying to figure out that product market fit. And his point is to kind of get it out there and, and then you, and then you tweak from there. So get it out there early, be as lean as you can. So the lean startup book, Eric Rees, you know, similar kind of idea yeah. on the lean side. So those are uh, those are all good ones. I would say those kind of focus, especially early on. Um, and then what you want to do is kind of get to the point where you the books aren't going to help you just because um, not that you're smarter than the books, but just that you're so specific that there's nothing in a book that's going to make you say, oh, that's the way to look at it. Like you're already you're in the weeds on your own industry and nobody knows it better than you. So I think that's what you want. You, you get a few books, kind of frame your, frame your mindset early on, and then you then you kind of get in the weeds as you go. Well, I mean, you you could write a book on uh, connecting CBD oil uh, influencers with jazzercise influencers. I mean, you, you've lived that life. So, you know, you could get real niche there. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. A lot of uh, usual day-to-day with the nonsense. So, yeah, my wife is looking forward to a startup book that <laughs> yeah. you know, would, would, would probably offend a lot of people that I've uh, uh, encountered yeah. throughout the years on, <laughs> on the stories. Yeah. Oh. Um. So what is it like a non-business practice thing that you do that kind of help, kind of help keep you focused or inspired? So, uh, you know, what, meditate, relax, sports, what is it? Yeah, sports is good. I still kind of live that. We, we talked uh, previously about the, the eight-year-old life. And I mean, I, I still kind of live life like I guess I'm eight years old where <laughs> yeah, I play. I play basketball. I watch sports. I guess I drink beer now. So that's more of a, a recent 21 and well, 16 and up thing. Um, don't tell my parents um, on that one. So yeah, I like to go out. I like to go to bars. Uh, I got the family, so that keeps you busy, um, and obviously keeps you focused elsewhere on nights and weekends, which is nice. Yeah. Early on, I think you work. I just kind of worked all the time. So when I started, first three, four, five years, I just kind of worked nights, worked weekends. I mean, you just work all the time, and I think that's what you need early on. But then it's good to get the breaks and have your have your family and do the other yeah. things in your, in your off time and have that life away. Cause you can, you can then turn it off. Um, one of our early 
employees with our first company, I mean, he was basically like a co-founder. He just kind of burned himself out after a couple of years because he would work all the time and just never had a break. And your mind keeps going after you're done working. So his mind would just kind of, it was always running. Yeah, never rest. It's, it's yeah. Good to, yeah, it's good to shut it off. Not that you're going to stop thinking about it. And that's not a bad thing because it gives you, um, you know, a lot of times you come up with solutions when you're not act- actively working. So right. once you get established and you're in that groove where the business is kind of working, then I think if you can peel back the time, it's helpful because then you can focus on things that are important versus. So, Josh, I, I heard that for uh, staying focused, um, beer and sports. I mean, essentially, that, that's what I picked up from there. Yeah. So there we go. I get great entrepreneurs. Yeah, I've, I've got important. I've got my weekend plans. I'm gonna I'm gonna get inspired this weekend. <laughs> that's right. But yeah, football football Sunday. Watch a lot of football. Yeah, we it, it was funny. Uh, this is back with you know, Lead Dino. We had the startup office. Josh, you were there at the yeah. big loft and all that stuff. And that was when. Uh, it was all the focus drugs were the thing with the startups in Silicon Valley, right? Everyone's doing Adderall. What are they doing? What are they doing to get the edge? Yeah. What are they doing to stay up all night? And we would go to lunch and I would have a burger. We'd have two IPAs and it would be flowing. Hmm. And we talked to the bartender for you know, a couple hours and I'd come back and just kind of crank out a newsletter and it would flow and we did marketing stuff. And that was that. So uh, the, yeah, two IPAs and a burger for lunch. That was kind of our, our drugs of choice. That's the name of your next book. Two burgers, a uh, burger and two IPAs is the new Adderall. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's your focus, kids. Yeah, yeah that's it. Right. Uh, just yeah. as much focus, not as much weight loss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, nice. A cool, a cool 1,100 calories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Before you go sit yeah. in a chair. Uh, All right. So someone walks up to you and they're like, "Hey, you got to acquire one skill right now. We'll give it to you. What would it be?" Well, now that I'm getting older with the basketball game and I've been working on it, but I would still, if they could give it to me, I would take an automatic three point shot because you got to kind of bring your game farther uh, from the hoop. And especially if you had range where you get, we play on a small court, get that curry range where you just kind of step over half court. People got to guard you out there or if they get in you, then they can get into the bully ball and start roughing them up a little bit. So for looking out for the next 10 or so years of playing, it's definitely that, uh, Dialing the in three. the three point shot. The deep yeah, three. I like right. it. Right. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> perfect. And then uh, last one. So, if you had the chance of being cast on any movie or TV show, uh, what 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 series, what movie are you are you jumping into? Well, I go back. I guess I got to go back to what we talked about a few lightning questions ago, and I guess they have to be Cheers. And I never thought about it, but that was my favorite show as a kid. <laughs> I just throw me at that bar and I'm good to go. Yeah, there you go. Find an inspiration. Which yeah. I, I think they, they shut that bar down, didn't they? I think they did. Yeah, during COVID. Yeah. Ah. Another Sad. Boston tragedy. Okay. Ah. Terrible. Yeah. yeah. Terrible. Oh, awesome. Well, uh, uh, super awesome. Thank you so much for being on. I mean, ho- hopefully this uh, uh, turns the light on for some people to, uh, you know, I'm not going to say go get a bunch of credit card debt, but at least uh, focus on self-funding versus uh, investor money. Um, and, you know, kind of open the, open the doors there. Uh, but thank you so much for being on the show again. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, absolutely. Brett. Thanks, man. That was awesome. Uh, okay. And then uh, a quick disclaimer, uh, nothing we said can and should be taken as tax legal or financial advice. Uh, so please, if anything sounded interesting, um, go follow up, do your own research, uh, contact Brett if you need to, um, and ask him a few questions. Um, but, but seek good counsel before making any decisions. Thank you so much again for listening. And, and Brett, thank you again for being on the show. Thanks guys. Thanks man.